on behalf of the members of the Newman Association of America, the Pittsburgh and New Brunswick Oratorians, and the participants and presenters of the 2010 National Newman Conference, I thank you. I thank you for your presence with us here this evening and your witness to us of the Church of Pittsburgh and her interest and support in the cause of John Henry, soon to be Blessed Newman. Well, this is the, uh, the annual conference for the Newman Association of America, but this year is special because it was all in preparation for the beatification of, of Cardinal Newman next month in Rome. The Newman Institute is a community that we, we bring together scholars from throughout the world, actually, just not the United States. And from Mexico, from Guadalajara. My main university is Trinity College in Dublin. Um, I'm also studying at the Catholic University of Levain. That community is important because we're developing uh, a, a sense of Newman studies. And again, the very broad, multi uh, interests, it's just not theology. The ethos of the people here is fundamentally one of, of a love of Newman and a desire to learn about the Holy Trinity from him. I first discovered Newman in college when I ended up doing an independent study on the Oxford movement. I started reading Newman just because um, there were questions that Catholicism were raising for me that I felt like I needed to have answered. I was studying philosophy and I was very interested in, in rationality and how it relates to faith. Well, I first heard about Newman when my dog was named Newman after my dad named him. And we also built a room in our house called an oratory, so I was kind of wondering who this guy was. I've been a Newman fan for about 20 years since I was introduced to him at Franciscan University at Steubenville. Well, when I was a graduate student at Cambridge, and I was doing a, 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 a thesis on, on George Eliot, and I began reading some of these Victorian prose writers, and, and of course it struck me that Newman was was so much more intelligent, or not, but he, was also, you know, he stood out from people like Carlyle and Ruskin and Matthew Arnold. So we were at the Notre Dame Institute in Jerusalem, and it was right before Easter, and the main celebrant for the Easter Mass was going to be uh, Cardinal uh, Joseph Ratzinger, who stayed at the Institute. So one morning early, I was sitting out on the porch, minding my own business, reading the book, Parochial and Plain Sermons by John Henry Newman. And uh, a gentleman came up to me, I didn't really recognize him at the time, and he says, are you reading that book? And I says, yeah, I am. And he says, I'm reading it too. And I said, oh, yeah. And uh, he says, I'm, uh, you know, Joseph uh, Ratzinger. And he says, guess who else reads this book? I said, I don't know. He says, Pope John Paul. Something different is now happening in the Newman community. No longer merely just a academic, scholarly pursuit, a admiration of his mind, of his ideas, his thoughts, but now to, to really have Newman as the one of the blessed and interceding for us in a personal way from the kingdom of heaven. We come together to celebrate the sacred Eucharist you know, as we give thanks to John Henry Cardinal Newman for many gifts and qualities in his life. But perhaps the most important and preeminent is that which will be recognized next month, his holiness. The expectation of a miracle, we've waited so long that uh, to really, what, you know, at a certain point it was like, well, someday it might happen. And so it was with me on June 6th of the year 2000 when I began a rather wondrous and mysterious journey from pain and suffering to the unfathomable reaches of the communion of the saints in heaven by means of a simple prayer. As I will discuss, interpersonal affection based in trust and love is the ground of faith. And I suggest that there can be no greater demonstration of interpersonal love than an act which heals. I awoke that morning to excruciating and debilitating pain in both legs. Rushed to a local hospital, the physician in the ER ordered a CAT scan of my back. And it reveals a serious succession of lumbar disc and vertebrae deformities protruding inward, literally squeezing the life out of my spinal cord, causing severe stenosis in both legs. The doctor advised that I should seek immediate treatment from one of the spinal specialists in Boston, as it appeared likely that all of my lower functions 
would soon shut down. Just the prayer, lead kindly light. The way he put up with injustice and the way he put up with suffering, even at the hands of the church, uh, has made a profound impression on me because, you know, not everyone that works uh, for and within the church are always happy about the things that transpire in their lives. And as time went on, I became increasingly gripped by tension and anxiety because I was also scheduled to begin my third year of studies in the diaconate formation program in Boston. Uh, amidst encircling gloom, lead thou me on. We're going to have times of desolation. We're going to have times of being lost. We're going to have times when, quite honestly, we're not in control. Then in mid-July of 2000, I met with the chief of spinal surgery at one of the major hospitals in Boston. After reviewing the films, he stated, without question, yours is the worst back I've seen in 17 years. And then we have to find ourselves, admit to ourselves that we're in the dark, and we have to ask that the kindly light will lead us, even amid the encircling gloom. He warned me that I should forget about my plans for diaconate formation. When things look their darkest, to have that, that faith and that hope that um, you know, God remains present and is leading us into the future. And I returned home after this tragic news, totally distraught, and turned on the TV, switching through the channels until I came to EWTN and started to watch it for some consolation. And the program featured Father John McCloskey interviewing an English Newman scholar by the name of Father Ian Carr. And we both spoke in London at the Brompton Oratory and I said that I quoted Newman saying, we may not know till we get to heaven what we were sent on this earth to do. And I said, well I now, I think I know what I'm sent on this earth to do, which was to go from the Cotswolds in England to Arndale, Birmingham, Alabama for, that, for those programs, one of which he happened to be watching. They spoke of Newman's, Newman's uniquely difficult life. Though the night is dark and I cannot see, one step at a time shall be enough for me. His crisis in his vocation. One of the reasons that I'm so taken with Newman is that Newman is not a, a lightweight. He gave up evangelicalism and he gave up simplistic religion and he gave up simple answers to complex questions a long time ago. It's never been a question that Newman has been able to change uh, the lives of, of people in, in moral conversions and conversions to the Catholic faith. My first introduction to the Catholic Church was through masses at the oratory. And I came into that knowing nothing about the Catholic Church. Um, I didn't come from another religion. I was never baptized. My parents never went to church. I was studying to be a Protestant pastor at Duke Divinity School, where we were, we were exposed to the church fathers who raised a lot of questions for me about the nature of the church. And during that time, I turned to Newman kind of because I had heard about the rudiments of his spiritual journey. And it was through his writings that I came into the Catholic Church. If I had been um, studying the existentialists in graduate school and really came to that point of leap of faith in my own life. All of the things that we do in the Catholic Church, for all of them we have very, very good reasons. It doesn't mean that everybody knows them and that everybody understands them and everybody um, even agrees with them. But in fact, we have wonderful reasons for absolutely everything that we do. I entered the church and uh, I've decided on a more academic vocation to be a theolo theologian. And so Newman uh, is a model not only of holiness, but you know how to do theology uh, faithful to the church. His habits of mind and his ways of reflecting on things I feel have been very formative and are very useful for connecting with young people. Newman um, gave to me an, uh, an, a way to talk about God. As well as the ongoing efforts at his beatification. And also in thanksgiving for uh, the, the diligence and the uh, long waiting and long suffering of those who have worked for the canonization process through the years. Since 1975, we've been promoting his cause, and now we get to see the fruits of it. To so many people who have, have prayed for the miracle and have prayed for the beatification for so long, um, to, to have Deacon Sullivan able to come and, and not simply speak, but preach to us, um, is, is a wonderful reward. And at the end of the program, the viewing audience was asked to report any details of any divine favors received after praying to Cardinal Newman. His faith uh, from 
the kingdom of heaven is still active and present in the life uh, of Christians here below, that we are, t we are to turn to him with, with confidence, with trust, with petition, uh, asking for his intercession to really change our lives. The intercession of the saints took time for me to warm up to, but over time I realized, you know, it wasn't contradictory with the, the idea of Christ as mediator, but again, that God, you know, it doesn't detract from God's glory that he chooses to bestow grace upon human beings who then participate in that activity. Certainly, and you know, in our own house, we have the tradition of praying uh, to Newman every day. Uh, and so it's that intercessory prayer that Newman thought was the privilege of a Christian. So because of this request, I pray to Cardinal Newman with all my heart. This is my exact prayer. Please, Cardinal Newman, help me to walk so that I can return to classes and be ordained. I didn't pray for complete healing as I felt that would be too much to ask for. Merely to grant me this, this favor, which at that time was so urgent. One thing that Newman says over and over is, you know, we have to have faith, we have to have hope that God's continuing to guide the church through the Holy Spirit. And I take that idea not only on kind of an institutional level, but on a personal level to say, you know, to, to be reminded constantly that God is guiding our lives. Then I went to bed. And to my utter amazement, I woke up the following morning virtually pain-free. I could walk normally. I could walk with strength in both of my legs. Whereas the day before, I was all hunched over in complete agony. It moved people's hearts. And to, to hear, to, to meet a man, and, and to hear the story, that miracles happen. How often do you meet a person who has been healed miraculously, and that miracle has gotten somebody beatified or canonized? I was then directed to Dr. Robert Banco, renowned as one of the foremost spinal surgeons in the United States. He first examined me noting my ability to walk upright, without pain, with strength in both my legs. But then he viewed the MRI and myelogram, noting that my physical condition hadn't changed at all. But still, I was completely pain-free. He was totally mystified, admitting that something rather remarkable was happening. And as a result, he said that he personally would not recommend such delicate surgery without the symptoms of pain and disfigurement. And he promised he would stay with my case. For as he stated, the situation can't possibly last very long. In fact, it lasted for nine months. And then the pain unexplainably returned in full fury immediately after my last class in April of 2001. I didn't realize all the details. I didn't know that he actually had to, um, or that I should say that Newman intervened twice. But now I was faced with the physical rigors of my past pastoral internship program three nights a week for the next four months at one of the largest hospitals in Boston. And during these months, it was total agony. Every time I had to walk, and I had to walk extensively visiting patients, we had so much in common. Uh, there has to be a compassion on the part of ministers, and they really have to meet the students where they are. Uh, to love them, which Newman, certainly, if you know anything about his relationships with others, he was a man capable of great love and great compassion. I was very struck with the fact that Newman as a tutor considered himself responsible for the spiritual life of his students. Cardinal Newman once wrote, true religion has two sides to it, a beautiful side and a severe side. And we all will surely stray from the narrow path that leads to life if we indulge ourselves in what is beautiful while casting aside 
what is severe. That to me is a frustration, you know, the, the world's um, uh, disdain for the church because it seems to want um, answers that are really almost sentimental. You know, in this one prayer we pray uh, uh, about Newman's compassion for the perplexed. Newman really pressed certain questions in my own life about where is the church. If there's something that I'm always looking for in life, it's truth with the capital T, and that's what Newman was looking for. For days after the surgery, I was still suffering incredible pain with no relief in sight. And if I were lucky, my recovery would now take at a minimum four to six months, definitely preventing me from returning to my fourth year of classes. They were scheduled to begin in three weeks from my surgery. And five days after my surgery, when I was told I couldn't return to classes, I felt compelled to get out of my hospital bed and attempt to walk. But the pain was so agonizing that it took me more than 10 minutes merely to slide to the edge of my bed. I was completely helpless, and the situation now seemed hopeless. Holiness isn't just a, a one-time event in, in our life. It's uh, through trials and tribulations, and it's that, uh, that journey uh, that, that John Henry Newman himself took, that perseverance to, uh, for perfect, towards perfection. Really, his ever-pursuing quest for holiness is what I find most inspirational. Those who have studied his works are, are moved, and certainly that is a, a spiritual dimension. It's not just an intellectual influence. But uh, the, the greater church, the, the, the universal church, doesn't know of, of Newman uh, in, in the regard of, of his spirituality, of a, a, this sense of really developing a, a cult of Newman, uh, a cult in the sense of a culture uh, that is a part, an important part of, of the church, especially in, in uh, our modern world. Well, I think that Deacon Jack tells us, says a lot, doesn't it? Because he, he wouldn't call himself an academic or intellectual, but it was his prayers that actually have got us to this point. It was again this severe moment that led me to prayer. The exact same prayer I made the year before and under the same circumstances. I called upon my special intercessor and faithful friend, please Cardinal Newman, help me to walk so that I can return to classes and be ordained. And by this prayer, Heart was certainly speaking to heart. I've been brought up on Catholic schools, but a lot of it was like rules of the Catholic faith, and this is that, and this is what you should be learning, this is what you should study, and these are the prayers. But he really brings in a whole different light of like philosophy and where it all comes from. People are not going to be attracted to externals, to, to just ritual for the sake of ritual. Um, it's not enough to know uh, the truths of the faith. It's not enough to know about the faith. One has to know Christ, and Newman certainly a uh, new Christ. All will turn to evil if I am not sustained by the unchangeable. All will turn to good if I have Jesus with me, yesterday and today the same and forever. In a higher world it is otherwise, but here below to live is to change and to be perfect is to have changed often. This is in line with those, those uh, little maxims he records in the Apologia, which he learned as a child, as a teenager, from his evangelical Anglican teachers, uh, holiness rather than peace, and even more, growth the only evidence of life. And I think that the application here is much, much broader uh, than the doctrine of the church, but it's about our hearts, our life, and maybe it's no surprise that he chose core on core locutor, heart speaks to heart as his cardinalatial motto. Uh, and it's the authenticity of a, of a conversion, and that's what we're all about in our ministry, inviting students into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And Newman, he, he is a person uh, who models heart speaking to heart, and that has to be the path of ministry, uh, particularly with young people today. I'm 21 years old. Um, I'm just an ordinary, everyday guy, and uh, I'm just seeking in my own life to, to, li uh, to live out that particular service that um, God has assigned to me. I think Newman 
speaks to our generation because he has this personalist bent, which a lot of people can identify with, and yet he's always bringing us back to the ultimate questions. Ultimately, he ends up having both the head and the heart. And see, Catholicism is always both and rather than either or. We have the scripture and tradition. We have the word of God and we have the Eucharist. We're sinners and we're saved. Jesus was human and divine. And Newman was very much of the head, but also very much of the heart. And suddenly I felt a tremendous sensation of intense heat. Intense heat all over. And a strong tingling feeling throughout my body. Both of which lasted for a long time. I also felt an indescribable sense of joy and peace, as though in the presence of God, and a strong sense of confidence and determination that finally, finally I could walk. And when this beautiful occurrence subsided, I realized I was not in this position anymore. I was standing upright. To hear someone give that testimony of this phenomenal experience of God breaking in on the physical universe. But then to see this man walking and, and, and obviously uh, uh, healed of that affliction. It's so different than reading it in a book. I immediately exclaimed to the nurse, I have no more pain. Whereas minutes before I was bent over in complete agony. And during these precious moments, these precious moments. I was totally captivated, totally transfixed by God's loving presence. We read about the saints a lot. We know that they intercede for us. Um, but here we have somebody who experienced it physically firsthand, relating that to us. And then I realized that now I could walk. When I couldn't for months, I could walk upright. I could walk with strength in my back and my legs. You see, my healing became remarkably and wonderfully accelerated in one moment of time, rather than taking four to six months. And totally invigorated, I sprinted out of my room and then up and down the corridors of my floor with a nurse tagging behind, yelling, slow down, slow down. How could I slow down? And being I've been in business and there's a lot of struggles and you can't see it all, but you know, if there's one step at a time, that's all, that's all you pray for. Dr. Banco in a recent televised interview, actually it was last week, he stated that the spine is usually the size of a quarter, but in Jack's case, it was compressed to the circumference of a pea. He should have been paralyzed long ago. And regarding the issue of recovery, he said, total recovery from spinal surgery ranges from weeks to months, depending upon its severity. Jack's condition was the worst I'd ever seen, and surgically the most difficult I've ever performed. But in Jack's case, there was no period of recovery whatsoever. You see, his condition after his prayer was if he never had a spinal problem, or even spinal surgery for that matter. He stated there is absolutely no medical or scientific explanation for what happened to Jack. It was truly a miracle. In all my years before Jack's surgery or since, I've never seen anything like it. One year later, on September 14, 2002, on the feast of the triumph of the cross, I was ordained a deacon at the Cathedral of the Holy Cross in Boston. <laughs> And without knowing the date of my ordination, 
the postulator for Newman's cause notified me on that same day by emailing Father Drew Morgan that the fathers at the Birmingham Oratory had voted to formally initiate the process for the beatification of their founder, the Venerable John Henry Cardinal Newman, and to take my case to Rome. The thing I'm very proud of is that it was listen, listening to me talk about Newman on EWTN that, 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 that got Jack praying. When I started to receive calls from Jack, uh, letting me know about about this. I, I heard from the postulator for Newman's cause that uh, indeed the, there was interest in this particular case. Was this notification a providential sign from God that my prayer to Cardinal Newman was indeed miraculously answered? Of, uh, you know, the real effect of miracles come from uh, great faith and prayer. And that's something that I've learned from Deacon Jack Sullivan, that um, prayer, and faith um, can go really, it can really go um, so many miles. Um, I know that it was a beautiful sign, affirming not only that my remarkable healing came from God at Cardinal Newman's intercession, but also through my suffering, some greater good, some higher purpose might be achieved that Cardinal Newman might soon be counted as one of the blessed in heaven. God bless you all. Um, but it's quite remarkable that uh, this miracle has, has uh, occurred uh, to an American, um, a lawyer, and uh, also, as he comments, uh, a lawyer from Boston. Well, that's when they play DC. It really shows that miracles can happen to anyone. He really apparently knew next to nothing about Newman. He, he just knew, of course, he knew the name. When I was in the cathedral at Mass, I thought, isn't this marvelous to have so many people together um, really honoring Newman? And I thought Newman would be happy, he'd be surprised because he was always so humble. But um, I, just, I just stood there and I thought, thank you, Newman, for everything because he really did a lot also for me in my life. I would really invite you to look and understand the writings and the life of, of Cardinal Newman. Because he's written so much, um, like so many books and everything, it's he's provided everything for us. If we just, you know, put ourselves and discipline ourselves to read those kinds of things, I think it would be really beneficial to us. It's confirmed my faith that, that there really is a place for the mind in the process of belief. I found uh, in Newman like a friend. He's a man for all seasons, is like they say in the movies, and uh, I think he could really help us get closer to God if you just give him a chance, read, pray to him, he'll answer you. Canonizations follow ra very rapidly often, beatifications. Why? Because people start praying. The people start going to say, well look, he, Newman, uh, through Newman, Jack Sullivan was healed, maybe he'll help me. But now to have, have Newman uh, be one who miraculously intervenes for us in human history, in, in our personal histories. We, we, I think we really are, in some sense, changed and challenged to, to now uh, develop this culture within the church of Newman as one of the blessed.